Welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar, Funding Administrative and Overhead Costs in Government Grants and Contracts, Making the Uniform Guidance Work for Your Nonprofit. My name is Sandy Green, and I am the organizer for today's webinar. Today's webinar will be a great chance to learn about how your organization can get the maximum benefit from the uniform guidance, OMB's new rules for federal agencies and state and local government pastors that fund nonprofits, including sexual assault programs. Before we get started, I want to go over some logistical information about the webinar. Throughout the presentation, your lines will be muted. However, we would like to make this presentation as interactive as possible. Um, there is a chat box at the bottom left of your screen. Please ask questions or give comments throughout the webinar. Uh, the presenter and I will both be paying attention to your questions, and we will answer them um, as they come in and then have another opportunity at the end of the webinar to have more interaction. Uh, interactive conversations. The materials from this presentation will be recorded and be available on our website within a week. Um, if you are sharing a computer with your coworkers, um, please email me the name of the additional participants, and that email is sandy, S-A-N-D-Y, at wixap.org. And this webinar will count as one and a half hours of ongoing training credits, and you will receive an email afterwards uh, for your verification and records. So I would like to remind everyone that at the end of this webinar, you will receive an email with an evaluation as well as a PowerPoint from the training. Please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation. Uh, our presenter for today is Kay Soul, and she will be joining us uh, any second now and give you some background information on what she brings to the conversation. Thank you again for joining us. This is Kay, and thank you, Sandy. I'm really pleased to be talking with all of you again. I've known some of you in the special assault program for a number of years. Um, in the intervening years, um, my practice has become national, and so for the last two years, I've actually been concentrating on the changes in federal rules that are it used to be called the super circular and now are called the uniform guidance. As some of you know, I bring sort of an unusual perspective to this. Uh, for many years, I was an executive director of a nonprofit organization. I'm also an accountant and have been an auditor and have worked for funders, and I have sort of a little bit of everything, including a lot of experience as a board member. So I have to tell you that the perspective that I'm taking on this topic probably comes most directly from having been an executive director and um, trying to think about what these changes in the federal rules might actually mean in terms of a nonprofit organism or services. Now, of course, that's one of the problems, that word indirect, and so we're going to be talking a lot about the issue of what is an indirect cost and how does that connect to an administrative cost because one of the things we know about this whole subject is that the vocabulary that is used by the federal government, by the states, by the counties, and by nonprofits is quite inconsistent even within one type of entity, like within the federal government or within the nonprofit sector. So as we go through this discussion, I'm going to try really hard to define how I am using terms so that you will be able to, I hope, understand what I'm talking about. Now, our real goal today is to look at the four different ways that these new federal rules that we're calling the Uniform Guidance, four different ways that nonprofit organizations can charge their administrative and other indirect costs to contracts or awards, grants, that you receive either directly from the federal government or by way of a pass-through like the state of Washington or perhaps your county or city. So, of course, what's gotten a lot of people interested in this topic is that the uniform guidance, the new rules, actually came up with one completely new way for nonprofits to charge for those administrative or indirect costs. So, of course, we're going to talk about the new way, but for many of us, we always had questions about the old ways, and so we're also going to talk about that, and my goal is that by the end of the webinar, you are going to feel either like it's clear to you already which way is going to work for you, 
or like you have the tools you need to go ahead and make that decision because part of what I'm going to be talking about is how you could test which would be the best approach for you. Okay, so now I'm going to move on and ask you a question, which is, who are you? And, of course, we don't have time to have everybody introduce themselves. What we want to do is use the polling feature. And if you've done a webinar before, you know that all you need to do is click on the box that uh, would best describe who you are in relation to this topic. And, okay. And so we have the poll up on the screen, but I'm not seeing people uh, respond yet. So I'm hoping people will let us know who they are. There we go. I can see the responses now. And just as Sandy and I have been thinking, we have a very mixed audience today. And that's what the wants to do with the different people who actually need to participate in this decision. Now, those of you who are principal board managers and your grant writers, contract managers, be sure that everybody is on the same page about what your organization is actually going to do. So I want to start back a little bit at the beginning and say, you know, what what is this? What are we talking about? Well, all of us, I think, who have been recipients of federal funds, either directly or through uh, pass-through entities, all of us have been very tuned in to the Office of Management and Budget, A110, A122, the circulars that used to tell us in the nonprofit sector how we were supposed to manage federal funds. But what has happened now, that is after December 26, 2014, is that the Office of Management and Budget has published in the Code of Federal Regulations, that's the CFR, they've published new rules that really have a very strong impact on nonprofit organizations. They also have a very powerful impact on the state and local governments that pass federal dollars through to nonprofits, and for any of us in the nonprofit sector who actually pass money through to another nonprofit, if we have a subrecipient agreement, it's going to affect us too, and I'm going to define that term in, in just a moment. So, you know, one of the problems in understanding the uniform contract, and so if, I want to be clear what we are talking about agreement with the feds or with the state or with the county. The key issue is whether this agreement between you and the funding source says that it is subject to the uniform guidance. And the way it's going to express that most frequently is to refer to the agreement as either an award or a subaward, and to refer to you, the nonprofit organization, as either a recipient or a subrecipient. Now, you would be a recipient of a federal award if you had a direct award from a federal agency, like federal HHS or HUD. You would be a sub-recipient if what you had was an agreement with the state of Washington or with a county or a city, and they told you, hey, there is federal money in this agreement, and that makes you a sub-recipient. Now, being a recipient or being a sub-recipient means the uniform guidance does apply, and it is very different in the minds of the federal government than being a contractor or a subcontractor, even though the word contract may appear in your agreement. And that's because the uniform guidance is now defining the term contractor to mean what we used to mean when we said vendor. Some of you have been in this field for a long time. You have had A133 audits. You know you've been required to distinguish between vendor agreements and grant agreements. Okay, in the uniform guidance, the Fed substituted the word contractor 
for the word vendor. Who is a vendor? Well, how about a plumber that you call? And you don't expect them to know the federal rules or enforce them. You expect them to know how to do the plumbing. They are a contractor in relation to you. Now, you might have an IT consultant who also is a contractor. In other words, you are not holding them responsible for complying with all of the federal rules in the uniform guidance. Another term that just creates confusion is the term pass-through. And the Uniform Guidance has some big news for pass-through entities. And when they use that term, they are talking about a recipient or a sub-recipient who is going to turn around and award funds to another entity. So if you are getting money from the state of Washington, from the domestic violence program. You are a sub-recipient if they are giving you federal funds, and they are a pass-through entity. If you, in turn, are sub-awarding some of that money to another nonprofit, but holding them accountability accountable for knowing the rules of the program and possibly for determining eligibility and doing all the record-keeping required, in that case, you could be a pass-through entity. So now we're going to talk about how all those terms come together to create these four specific ways that when we use the term recover, that means you're able to charge to a federal award. And when I say you can charge it to, I mean you can actually get the money to cover that cost. So under the uniform guidance, the new rules, we now have four different ways for a subrecipient or a recipient, a nonprofit organization, to be able to recover or charge for its administrative and other indirect costs. Now we're going to go into more detail about well, what is an indirect cost and is it the same thing as an administrative cost in a moment. But first I just want you to think about these four different ways. The first one is the new one. It's called the 10% minimum rate or de minimis at a minimum rate. Of course, it's not just any 10%. It's cost charging method. And this is the method that many of us have been using if we have had a cost allocation plan, we haven't had an indirect cost rate, and what we have done is use our cost allocation plan to decide what is the fair share of our administrative cost and other indirect or common costs that we can charge to a particular award or contract. Um, so we'll illustrate that one, and we'll talk about, uh, is that one still in play? Would you still like to use that one? Now, the third one is also new, uh, but it has kind of a question mark by it, and that is if your pass-through entity, like the state of Washington or like your county, decides that they are willing to negotiate an indirect cost rate with you, they may do that. And the rate that they negotiate with you will be useful for you in relation to them, but they can't bind any other pass-through entity, and they can't bind a federal agency. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. And finally, the fourth option, if you have a direct federal award, you can negotiate an indirect cost rate. Now, that, that's always been true under A122, but there's some really interesting changes about who has to pay attention to that rate, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a moment. So our whole point today is to help you figure out which of these four methods is going to work best for you. So here's the big news on the federally negotiated indirect cost rate. And we use the acronym NICR to talk about those rates. That's negotiated indirect cost rate. Here's what the Uniform Guidance says to the pass-through agencies like the state of Washington. Um, if you encounter a nonprofit organization that has a negotiated indirect cost rate, you must Accept it. In other words, pastor entities cannot say, oh, we think that's too high, we won't pay that. If the federal government, through their indirect rate negotiation process, has determined that this is a fair rate, then all the pastor entities must honor it. 
Now, there's more message to the pass-through entities, and that says, well, you know, hey, if you have nonprofit organizations that you are funding that do not have federally negotiated indirect cost rates, if you would like to negotiate an indirect rate with them, you may. And then the biggest news of all to those pass-through entities, if you have these nonprofit organizations that you're funding, they don't have a negotiated indirect cost rate, maybe you don't want to negotiate indirect rates with them, they have the right to use the 10% de minimis rate, and you must honor it. They don't have to get your permission. It is just given as a right to them in the uniform guidance. So it's uh, a pretty much a game changer in terms of pass-through entities needing to accept some version of reasonable administrative and indirect costs for nonprofit organizations. And the Uniform Guidance went further, and it said, actually, those pass-through entities and, and the federal government itself cannot force or entice nonprofit organizations to accept an indirect cost rate that is lower than their negotiated rate or the 10% de minimis rate. In other words, you can't issue an RFP and then give points or preferences for those with the lower indirect cost rate. It's if that now again I'm speaking about agreements where you would be doing an RFP and the funds that are going to be in that agreement are federal in origin. It applies when what's happened is the state or a county has blended federal funds with other funds, these rules still apply. So no more points or preferences for who has the lower indirect cost rate. Now, if you were with us for the earlier webinar, you know that we talked about why is this important to nonprofits, and it really comes down to this. We've got a culture in which donors have been so encouraged to think that they only want to pay for direct program services, and somehow it would be wrong to pay for your legitimate management costs. It's very hard to raise funds to actually cover the full cost of delivering a service. And one of the biggest problems has been that governmental funders have joined in with this idea that there's something wrong with paying for administrative or other common costs. And what the uniform guidance is really designed to do is to say, no, that is just, that's just a, a thought error, actually. If we want nonprofits to be strong and effective and deliver good services, we have to pay what it really costs. So now we're going to get down to some of the details of how these terms are used. And one of the terms that just creates the most confusion is the term indirect cost. There are so many misunderstandings about what this term means. Now, in the uniform guidance, there is a definition, and it is that these are costs that provide benefit to multiple programs or functions or different funding sources. It's a concept that does include your agency-wide administration. You know, for example, your agency-wide financial management but it's not limited to just agency-wide administration. The common element in a cost that is indirect is that it's not possible to determine the exact benefit that that cost is providing to each specific program or function or grant award. You have to estimate the benefit. Now, I suppose that if we were to get literal, if we were willing to spend a completely unreasonable amount of money to try to track the benefit, we might be able, in some cases, to track it down, but it would be a waste of money. So what we're doing is trying to take an efficient approach and estimate the benefit that one of these indirect costs provides to each and every program or what the feds call a cost objective. A cost objective is a, another term for a cost center, and it can mean a program, a project, or a particular funding award. 
But one of the areas of tremendous confusion is the word administrative. And I want to start by making a distinction between what I call agency-wide administrative costs and other administrative costs. So when we're talking about agency-wide administrative costs, we're talking about the cost to support your board. You know, you have to organize their meetings. You have to recruit board members. The cost to do strategic planning for the agency. The cost for overall financial management. We all have a general ledger accounting system. We all have an annual audit. We all have a payroll. All of those financial management functions. And if you're large enough to have high-level HR and IT management, so you have like a director of HR or a director of IT who does planning and oversight. I'm not talking about somebody who touches a computer. That does not make them an agency-wide administrative cost. This is someone who is actually managing your technology. These are the agency-wide administrative costs. They include the so-called executive function, which is really what do executive directors do when they're not fundraising. Now, in smaller organizations, one of the things executive directors do when they're not fundraising is they deliver program services. And to the extent that you are the executive director in one of those organizations where you actually deliver some program services, that portion of your cost is not an administrative cost. It doesn't matter what your title is. It's the nature of the work that you do. But if you're in a larger organization, you have a program director working under you, then probably most of what you do, other than fundraising, is some type of agency-wide administration, and it's an agency-wide administrative cost. Now, we're going to be talking about a lot of different methods for recovering these administrative and other indirect costs. But I just want to call out a particular rule that was in A122, the old rules. It's in the uniform guidance now again. And that is, while there's lots of different ways to do this, one way you cannot use is you cannot say the basis for my decision about how much of my agency-wide administration or my other common costs I'm going to charge to a particular agreement, a particular funding agreement, is whatever the funder will allow. You cannot say, well, this funder won't pay any admin costs, so we're not going to charge any to that cost center. That's actually specifically forbidden. So we're going to look at what do you do instead of that if that's particularly forbidden. So now it will help me to know a little bit more about your situation to understand how you're doing things currently. And things, I mean how when you have contracts or awards that you know contain federal funds, how do you go about charging for your agency-wide administration and your other common costs, like the cost of your computer systems or the cost of your telephone system. Now, I've put out some possible choices here. Some of you have already gone ahead and started using the 10% de minimis rule. Some of you have negotiated indirect cost rates. Some of you have probably been using cost allocation plans and direct charging. I know that in some of the agreements that the state of Washington has, you've been given a specified administrative cost amount, and you may just have been using that because it's in the agreement. And you might be using more of these methods, or if truth be told, you may have no idea what method you've been using. So I'm looking at the screen, and <coughs> excuse me, I looks like we're, and this is kind of what I have understood from talking to people in Washington, that a lot of people are using cost allocation with the direct charging method. We don't seem to have anybody on the call who has a negotiated indirect cost rate. I'm, I'm sort of hoping that they're here but not telling us because when we get to that option, it's always helpful to have people who are using it to be able to answer some of the questions. Okay, thank you for your responses. Ah, oh, we got one. Um, one negotiated indirect cost rate. So we'll have to ask you all our questions and uh, let you be the spokesperson for negotiating an indirect cost 
Great. Okay, so I just changed the screen so that you can see these four choices again. And you're going to notice that down at the bottom, I've got a little set of four boxes. I'm going to try to highlight which box am I talking about because this gets uh, pretty confusing pretty fast. So we're going to try to stay really clear. So right now, we're going to start with this new 10% minimum rate. And um, here's the key thing, uh, and I'm going to try to activate my arrow so that I can show you this. It worked. The most important thing to take away from this is it's not 10% of your total contractor award. If you have a $100,000 award and you think, oh, 10% of $100,000, that's $10,000, I get it. No, you don't get it. Um, you have to learn about modified total direct cost. You have to start by figuring out what your modified total direct costs are. And to do this, you have to understand uh, several things. One of them is you have to know the difference between an indirect cost and a direct cost. Now, remember, an indirect cost was one that benefited multiple programs, projects, and awards. A direct cost is one that you can identify the specific program that benefits. For example, here you'll see I, I'm talking about Program 1, and I have Program 1 direct costs of $1 million. These are all costs where I can show the direct relationship between that cost and that program. Maybe this is a staff person who is teaching in my early childhood program. Okay, that's what Program 1 is. That's the relationship of direct cost to the program. And I've gone through identifying the, the direct costs in all three of my programs that have federal money, but I have also identified direct cost in my non-federal programs. Now, to simplify this chart, I've just made that one column, but in real life, you may have three or six or eight cost centers that don't have federal money in them. But the important thing to understand about the modified total direct cost method is you have to put all your direct costs in. So you would have to put these uh, costs that are in non-federal programs. Then you add them all back together. And in this example, they added up to $4 million. So we took the 10% of the $4 million, and it was $400,000. But, of course, there's a little more to it than that. And um, that is that we have to understand what to do with the indirect cost. Now, let's start with the allowable indirect cost. Now, those of us who have had federal funds know that the rules for federal funds have always defined certain costs as allowable, other costs as unallowable, and some costs, they're sort of allowable sometimes. Well, they continue that in the uniform guidance. You can still look up a type of cost and learn whether it is allowable. But for right now, what we're really interested in is the indirect costs that are allowable. And in this example, they were $400,000. Now, that is in contrast to some unallowable indirect costs because we cannot include unallowable indirect costs in our indirect cost rate. That's because we can never charge them to a federal award. Well, what's an unallowable indirect cost? Well, I actually have a real example from a client of mine. I was quite astonished, but this organization has a practice of always serving alcohol at all of its board meetings. Now, supporting your board is an indirect cost, but alcohol is always an unallowable cost. So serving your board alcohol is an unallowable indirect cost, and I've got it in a separate column. Now, the final thing that may be confusing here is when I say, well, I thought these were going to be these white ones were going to be about indirect costs. Well, except for this one, which is about excluded direct costs. Now, Excluded is a very different word than unallowable. Excluded means we don't put it into the modified total direct cost calculation, but we are going to be able to charge it to the awards because it is an allowable cost. It's just excluded for purposes of computing the modified total direct cost. So the important thing to notice here 
is that the final column here, the total expenses, that is your total expenses. So if you were looking at your annual budget, this would be everything. Or if you were looking at your audited financial statements from last year, this would be all the expenses. And they could be divided up into the categories that I've shown here. They could, you could have identified the unallowable indirect costs, the excluded direct costs, the allowable indirect costs, and then the modified total direct cost. So the starting point for looking at this number in your organization is putting all of your information into this same framework. Now, I want to talk about what are these excluded costs. Now, remember, they are allowable. In fact, most of these costs, they're going to be line items in your budget with your funding source agreement. They're just excluded from the calculation of modified total direct cost. Now, the one we're going to be looking at as an example is the one in red. The portion of each subaward that you have made that is in excess of $25,000. So let's explain what that would be. If you, the nonprofit organization, are functioning as a pass-through entity and you have decided to subaward some funds to another entity to carry out a part of the program, and I, I, I have this situation with a client that serves a very large county, and they decided that it was one particularly remote part of their county where it would actually be more effective to do a sub-award to a local organization that was in that remote part of the county and let them run the program. Say so that's what a sub-award is. They're going to hold that other nonprofit organization to responsibility for following all of the federal rules. They're going to have to determine eligibility. They're going to have to match up the services to the clients. Um, but my client is making a sub-award. Now, here's the problem they had. The sub-award they made was for $65,000. And only the first 25000 could be put into their um, modified total direct cost calculation. So now I'm going back a slide and I'm showing that that 40,000, the part of 65,000 that was in excess of the 25,000, that's what got excluded. And in a moment we're going to look at, well, what did that do to the calculation and how did they ever get the rest of that money? But for right now, what we want to understand is that in order to do this calculation of the modified total direct cost, you're going to have to understand which of your direct costs have to be excluded from the modified total direct cost base. Now, I'm going to give our brains a rest, and we're going to come back and look at that in more detail in a moment. But I want us to consider before we get too far down the road in the 10% de minimis rate, I want to talk a little bit about another one of our choices, which is the direct charging method. And actually, when we did our poll earlier, this is the method that more of our participants today are using. Now, how do you use this method? Well, you have a written cost allocation plan. And in that plan, you identify, well, which costs need to be allocated because they are, you might not have used the word indirect, but they are costs that benefit more than one or probably all of our cost centers, meaning our programs, our projects, or our funding awards. So you've identified which costs have to be allocated, and then you've told in your plan how you're going to allocate each type of cost. So you might have identified financial management as an administrative cost, its agency-wide benefit, and you described what method you were going to use to allocate the cost of financial management. Maybe you also called out rent. Maybe you do all your programs in a common facility and you needed to allocate rent. And so you used a method to allocate rent. So in your cost allocation plan, you said, well, here's what a direct cost is. That's a cost I can directly associate with a cost center. Here's what an indirect cost is. And here's my list of indirect costs. And here are the methods we're going to use to allocate those indirect costs. 
Now, um, and then, of course, you have to follow your plan, right? That's always a given here. So let's take a look at how that would actually show up. In this organization, this is a different organization than we were just looking at. They do have three programs, and what I want you to notice is this shared column. Um, they had direct costs in each of the three programs. That's the first line item, the total, the total direct cost right here. But they also had this shared cost column where they had rent, they were in a common facility, they had an audit, they had accounting staff, they had utilities. They had a total of $150,000 in these shared costs. And they, the question is, how am I going to charge those to my federal awards? And the answer is that they have divided them up. They have used their cost allocation plan to allocate the rent, to allocate the audit, to allocate the accounting staff. They have, if I can reactivate my arrow, um, they have been able to divide them all up. And after they divided them up and figured out what portion belongs in Program 3, then they added them to the direct costs in Program 3. And this is what they're going to charge on the award for Program 3. So you might be wondering, how did they allocate them? And you have your own cost allocation plan, and you've probably used some of these methods. Um, maybe they said it's some version of percentage of FTE, so full-time equivalent employee. So they looked at the hours worked in each function. Or maybe they preferred the phrasing of time and effort, and they looked at the effort expended in each function, and they turned it into a percentage. So if they said, you know, Program 1 used 20% of all of the time and effort of our staff this month, then 20% of these indirect costs, or particularly, the, let's say, the financial management costs, are going to get charged to Program 1. Maybe they use the percentage of transactions. Now, some people in the financial management function want to count something. And so they put a counter on their AP system, and they say, well, 10% of all the transactions that we process through AP belong to Program 1, so we're going to charge 10% of our financial management costs to Program 1. I actually don't like that method, but it is a common method. Um, maybe they did percentage of participants. Half of our participants are in Program 1, so we're going to allocate our common costs with half of the costs going to Program 1. Same idea with units of service. So there's a lot of different methods that could work for allocating and direct charging. Of course, the one method we couldn't use is the method of saying, well, that funder doesn't allow me to charge anything for financial management, so I'm not charging anything. That would be an unallowable method. But any logical method that is a good way of estimating the benefit of a particular cost to a particular program or project or funding award, that's what you're going to put in your cost allocation plan. Now we're going to take a whirlwind to a tour of option three. This is negotiating with a pass-through entity. And, of course, the most important thing to understand about this option is you don't get to decide. Your pass-through entity will decide whether they are willing to negotiate an indirect cost rate with you or not. And if they are willing, then they will lay out a procedure for you to use to do that. Now, the uniform guidance tells them that they cannot use the negotiating process to try to force you to accept a very low rate because you're guaranteed the right to get at least 10% of the modified total direct cost. So it, it has to be a fair process, and I think most pass-through entities are assuming that if they're going to do this, they're going to use the same procedures, the same approach that the federal government uses when it negotiates an indirect cost rate. Now, I, I am just back from a particularly exciting meeting in Los Angeles, where Los Angeles County, which actually 
gives to nonprofits the second largest amount of federal money of any pass-through entity. That is more than all the states other than California. Really tremendous amount of federal dollars flowing through Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County has decided to negotiate indirect cost rates with their nonprofit recipients. And it's going to be quite magnificent when they put it in place and get it done probably quite a mess until that happens. But that's their decision, and, and no one can make them do it. It's totally their choice. Now, the interesting thing about these pass-through entities negotiating indirect cost rates is they can't bind any other entity to a rate. So let's imagine you do have a pass that's willing to negotiate, and you do the negotiation, and they say your indirect cost rate is 12%. That's just pick a number. No one else has to allow that rate to be used. They could. I mean, it would be a good decision to say, hey, that state agency went through all the process of negotiating an indirect cost rate. Of course, we're going to use it. But they're not required to do that. And that is different than if you had chosen our last option, the fourth option, which is negotiating directly with the federal government. Now, if you chose this option and got a negotiated indirect cost rate from a federal agency, then everybody has to honor it. So it's kind of different than if you were negotiating with a pass-through entity. But, of course, the key thing in negotiating a federal indirect cost rate is you can't do it unless you have a direct federal award, an award directly from a federal agency. You'll know you have one because you will have been given access to the federal treasury, and you can draw down your federal funds electronically without sending in requests for reimbursement. So if you have a direct federal award, you can negotiate an indirect cost rate. Now, here's how you do that. The first step is you have to figure out who is your cognizant agency. In most cases, this is going to be the federal agency that gives you the largest amount of money. So if you have several federal awards, look at them, figure out which one is the largest. If you have several from the same federal agency, like several from HHS or several from HUD, you can add them together and decide, well, which of those federal departments is giving us the larger amount of money? That's going to be your cognizant agency. Another way to ask your auditor, because they've already been figuring out who your uh, cognizant agency is. Okay, once you know who your cognizant agency is, then you want to go online, go to that federal department, and look for their guidance on how to negotiate an indirect cost rate. The federal departments all have identified some office to negotiate indirect cost rates. Some of them, like HHS, do their own negotiation, and DOL does its own negotiations, but HUD has DOL do negotiations for it. So you're going to have to learn your cognizant agency, where did they get the negotiation done. Once you know that key piece of information, you're going to download. All of them have a guide on how to apply. It's really pretty clear. It's a step-by-step process. If you just want to, you don't want to worry about a cognizant agency right now, you just want to understand how does, how does it work, um, Department of Labor probably has the best guide. And at the end of these slides, we have a link to their guide. And they explain exactly how to submit this proposal. Now, if you have somebody in your organization who has been able to get a federal award for you, you have the skill necessary to complete all the various certifications and assurances and just, you know, federal paperwork that goes into this until you get to the real business end of your proposal for an indirect rate. And that is a spreadsheet in which you're going to present all your costs. You're going to identify your direct and your indirect costs. You're going to show how you're going to deal with unallowable costs. And then you're going to choose a method. And there are multiple allowable methods for negotiating an indirect cost rate with a federal agency. It is not just this modified total direct cost method that we were talking about with the 10%. 
Um, it's uh, many more choices than that, and that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're going to try to do today. Um, but there are resources up on the web on that, and I'm happy to help you find them. Um, essentially, you're going to pick one of these methods, and you're going to complete the spreadsheet. They have templates you can download. So, I mean, this is pretty much just fill in the blanks approach to proposing a negotiated indirect cost rate. But the important thing to remember is it is a proposal, and that means that your negotiator has something to say about it, and they may not. Um, they may not agree with you. They might not agree with you on how you've classified direct and indirect costs. They might not agree with you about the method you chose. So you need to be prepared that this may be a back-and-forth process until um, until we get to the, the final negotiated rate. Once you hit that point, they are going to send you a letter that says, here is your rate, and here is the time period that it is valid for. And that's going to be really critical, because most of us who are new to negotiating an indirect cost rate are going to be given what's called a provisional rate, which is good for one year. And at the end of that year, you're going to have to submit financial information, your audited financial information, and there's going to be a truing up of what was your actual indirect cost rate. I get a little more detail than we can get into this time. Um, but if you have a direct federal award, this can be a really great thing to do. It kind of lays to rest all the arguments about how to charge for indirect costs. It, it just is simpler once you do the negotiation. But uh, now we're going to see, I think we, we ended up with maybe only one negotiated rate group. Maybe someone else joined us after we asked. So here's a question possibly for just one or two of you, so I hope you're still with us. Um, if you have a federally negotiated indirect cost rate, which base did you use? Did you use modified total direct cost? Did you use direct salaries or did you use total personnel cost? Or are you just not sure? And I'm looking to see. We got not sure. And, you know, and this is the sort of, uh, this is a surprise to me when I started working on this after the uniform guidance. I thought, oh, these people have been negotiating indirect cost rates for years. So I'm sure they really understand everything about it. Well, actually, more commonly, people don't understand much about it because they've just been copying over what someone did before. So if you do have a rate, um, and you'd like to think about, gee, are we using the best method possible? I'd encourage you to get a little bit more information. And, again, I can direct you to a recorded webinar that might really help you on that subject. But now I want to step back from this discussion of the federally negotiated indirect cost rate because, after all, only those of us who have a direct federal award can apply for one and get one. So I, I think the other three options are of greater interest to a, a greater number of people. So what we're going to do now is figure out how we could decide which method is best for your organization. And so we're going to spend some time testing using the 10% method. Why? Because it's really simple to use it. You just declare, I'm using it. Um, but it might not be the best method for you, so I don't, I'm don't. i hoping you won't just rush out and use it because of its simplicity, um, but you'll really test whether this is going to work for you. And then, you know, I will talk a little bit more about negotiating with a pass-through, and if you end up feeling like, well, that's what I really wish I could do, you could open some conversations with your pass-throughs. But there's a lot of factors that's going to determine their willingness to negotiate with you, and it's going to take some time and expertise on their part. So let's dig in a little bit more to the 10% de minimis rate. Now, one thing I want to make really clear, if your organization either currently has a negotiated indirect cost rate or you've had one in the past, you can't use this 10% rate. 
And, you know, one of the questions that was asked at the very beginning of the uniform guidance is, well, how are we supposed to know whether we had a negotiated indirect cost rate sometime in the past? We have staff turnover. We don't know. Well, here's how you're supposed to know. One, do you know whether you ever had a direct federal award? If you're pretty sure you didn't, then you couldn't have negotiated the rate. If you think you might have, um, you know, if you've had the same auditors for a while, I would check with them. They'll know whether you ever did this or not. They'll, they'll be a good starting point. But assuming you've never had a negotiated indirect cost rate, and now you just want to test out whether you should claim the 10% modified total direct cost method, um, here's the thing. You want to find out what your actual indirect cost rate would be using that modified total direct cost method. Because, you know, if it turns out that your rate is a whole lot higher than 10%, I don't think you're going to want to settle for the 10%. I think you're probably going to go back to using the cost allocation plan and the direct charging, because if you don't, as we're going to illustrate here, you're going to end up having costs that are real that you can't charge to your awards. Now, let's illustrate that. Okay, so remember when we computed the 10% modified total direct cost indirect rate? And in our example that we looked at earlier, we were talking about ending up with 10% of the $4 million in modified total direct cost base. And here's how we do what they call applying it, meaning this is how much we can charge for indirect costs to each of our three awards that have federal money in them, 10% of a million dollars, 10% of 2.1 million, 10% of 700,000. But we have to remember that we also have to charge that same 10% to the direct costs in our non-federal programs because we want to be able to add up all these charges that we're making for indirect costs, they got to add back up to the total, to the 400000 If we didn't charge this $20,000 to our non-federal cost center, who's going to pay for it? It isn't being allocated. That's, so that's a key rule. But another really interesting thing here is remember this $40,000 in excluded direct costs. Remember, that was the portion of the subaward that was greater than 25000 Well, we do get to add that back into Program 3. That's an allowable cost. It is in our budget, and it's going to be in the total that we can charge to that award. It just couldn't be in the direct cost because that's what modified means. You exclude these certain costs. Now, another sort of interesting thing in this example had to do with the alcohol for the board, the unallowable indirect cost. Well, unallowable, that means we can't charge it to any federal award. Where are we going to charge it? To our non-federal awards. How are we going to pay for it? Well, I doubt you're going to get foundation money to pay for your board's alcohol. I think this is going to have to come from your unrestricted sources. Okay, that's what it would look like if it just happened that your indirect costs were 10% using the modified total direct cost method. But what if your actual indirect costs were greater than that? Now, this example in this slide looks like the other example. It's got the direct costs laid out in terms of the three programs with federal money and the non-federal direct cost center. But in this example, we had more indirect costs. We considered more of our costs to be indirect. And so when we did the calculation, the indirect costs divided by the modified total direct cost base, we came up with 16%. That's our actual indirect cost rate using the modified total direct cost method. So let's see what happens if we were to accept the 10%, even though our real rate was 16%. Move my slide. Okay, here we go. If we were using the 
Um, 10% of $3.8 million is 380000 That's all we're going to take in charging our uh, federal programs for indirect costs. So program one, it had a million dollars in direct costs. We're going to charge it $100,000. Okay, and here we're going to charge 190 and here we're going to charge twenty, And that leaves us with $220,000 in indirect costs that were greater than that 10% amount. Now, we can't charge that to our federal awards because we're limited. If we took the 10%, then we're limited to the 10%. So we're going to have to bring it over here and charge it in our non-federal cost center along with the board's alcohol. And we just increase the burden for raising unrestricted funds very, very substantially. So I think in this example, we would not want to say yes to the 10% method because we would be adding $220,000 to our burden to uh, actually have to generate more unrestricted funds. So what are you going to do if it turns out that your actual indirect cost using the modified total direct cost method is greater than 10%? Well, if you have a direct federal award, negotiate an indirect cost rate. Um, another thing you could do is look very carefully at what you consider to be indirect cost. Now, here's the catch on that. If you take a very literal reading of the uniform guidance, it will tell you that what they mean should be in indirect cost. It's not just agency-wide administration, but other common costs, like your facilities costs, or like if you have a central telephone system, that cost, that they should all be lumped together in indirect costs. But the problem is, for many of us, that's always going to be more than 10%. And so there, there's probably about half of the professionals in the field who would say, well, if that's your situation, why don't you try this calculation defining indirect costs simply as agency-wide administration and use cost allocation to allocate your facilities and your telephone and those other costs. Now, there is nothing explicit in the uniform guidance that says you can do that, but in workshops across the country, Gil Tran, who leads the OMD uh, effort on the uniform guidance, has said, yeah, of course, that makes sense, uh, as long as you're not Scamming. What would scamming be? Well, scamming would be your actual indirect cost, your actual agency-wide administrative cost is like 7%, and instead of taking the 10% and using the rest of that to cover things like your rent and utilities and those other common costs, you did cost allocation for them and, and tried to claim more than your administrative cost within the 10%. Um, so this is, you know, I would talk to my auditor is actually what I would do, my independent auditor. Now, they're going to go through their song and dance about how they can't tell you what to do and it's a management decision, and that's all true. But you're going to say, yeah, I understand that, and I am going to make the decision. I just want your opinion about what the uniform guidance says and whether it would be a legitimate interpretation for us to take the 10% as the way we recover our agency-wide administrative costs and um, that we would use cost allocation for the facilities and other costs. And the third option, if yours is over 10%, is just say, okay, that's the way it is, and I'm going to use my unrestricted funds to pay what the feds won't pay, the legitimate cost that the feds won't pay. Okay, and we've talked about this already, so I'm going to move on. Now, I want to talk about a really difficult problem before we wrap up, and that is that while the uniform guidance was designed to bring uniformity to all the different federal programs, that was the whole origin of working on this, was that there were too many conflicts and different approaches being used by different federal agencies and different states, and the feds, OMB, wanted to have consistency. And so they said, we're going to write this uniform guidance. We're going to publish it in the Code of Federal Regulations. It's going to apply to all federal funds with very, very few exceptions. However, 
we understand that if a particular federal program has statutory limitations that might conflict with anything in the uniform guidance, the statutory limitations will always prevail. Federal statute overrules the uniform guidance. Well, it's not like this happens all the time, but there are specific federal programs where the most common statutory limitation is about administrative costs. Uh, some federal programs have a 10% administrative cap. Some have a 15%. Some have a 7%. Now, if one of your federal sources has a statutory cap, your funder should be able to give you the statutory citation. What federal statute does this limit appear in? Because a lot of times they will say, well, this program has an administrative limit of 10% or 5% or something else, but there isn't any statute. So you always want to ask for what is the statutory source of this limitation. The other thing you want to do is once you find the statute, read it really carefully because the way administrative cost limitations are most frequently expressed in the statutory limitations is as a percentage of the total grant. That is not the same thing as a percentage of modified total direct cost. So if you read that there's a 10% administrative cost limitation, see if it says of the total grant, because that would be a much larger number than 10% of your modified total direct cost. So it may not pose a problem for you, but it could. And it could pose a problem even if you had a negotiated indirect cost rate. Suppose your negotiated indirect cost rate is 18%. Now, if it's that high, it includes costs other than just agency-wide administration. It's going to include some facilities costs and some other common costs. So you're only going to need to test this 10% limit for the portion of your indirect costs that are administrative costs. So how would you do that? Well, you would figure out how does this limit work. You would compute what is the 10% they're talking about, and then you would compare that to the administrative cost that you were going to charge through your indirect cost rate or through cost allocation, and you would make sure that you did not exceed that statutory limit. So let's take a look at an example of using one of these um, administrative cost limits. In this case, it was a 5% limit. And we went back to the group that had the 10% indirect rate. We applied the 10% rate, and then we said, oh, wait, Award 1 has a 5% admin limitation. And that's going to mean um, that only 5% of the million dollars can be in the, in this case, it was of the modified total direct cost. Now, it might have been a higher number if it was 5% of the total cost, meaning we get to take the million plus the indirect cost. But in this example, let's say the limit was $50,000. We were about to charge $100,000. We can't do that because it exceeds the limit. So we're going to have to move that $50,000 overcharge over to the unrestricted fund. Because that's what they mean when they say there's a limit on admin. You can charge no more than that. Okay, and I'm not sure I've been totally clear on that, so we might have questions on that in, as we get to the end of our session. Well, I think I've talked about the primary things you can do if you have those statutory limitations, but the first thing to do is to figure out whether you have any. Um, now, I just want to mention, in case you haven't already been bombarded with information about the uniform guidance, that it changed a lot of things other than just the indirect cost. So take a look at some of the training that's available on those changes, because some of them are pretty substantial. I also want to acknowledge that there are certain exceptions to the uniform guidance, and probably the biggest exception is that um, the block grant programs, these are mostly passed in the 80s under Ronald Reagan, 
the uniform guidance does not apply fully to the block grant program. Why will the idea of the block grant program to want to give the states more authority in distributing federal money? Now, this is a really complicated set of questions because what is happening now is some of the federal agencies that administer these block grant programs are coming through and saying, you know what, it's too complicated for us to have most of our programs under the uniform guidance and then these few block grant programs not under the uniform guidance. That's just creating chaos. And so what they're doing is they're issuing regulations that make the provisions of the uniform guidance apply to block grant programs. Uh, what's an example of that? CSBG, if any of you get the community action money, there, we now have HHS saying, well, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to promulgate these regulations for CSBG that basically make the uniform guidance apply. So a message take away from this, you should always know the CFDA number of any federal source that you're getting either directly or in a pass-through award. Check out that CFDA number to be sure that it isn't one of the ones that has been excluded from applicability in the uniform guidance. You should be able to talk to your pass-through entity about this because they're actually required to tell you whether the uniform guidance applies or not. But I, I just don't want you to be surprised if some of you hear, well, it doesn't apply in this case. Now, this uniform guidance doesn't apply question is different from the statutory limitation on administrative costs. These are two different things because we can have a, a source of federal funds for which the uniform guidance does apply, but it still has a statutory limitation on administrative costs, so we're going to need to do our test to make sure that we are not violating that statutory limitation. Okay, well, that's probably just about as much of uh, visiting the federal mindset as an ordinary person can stand. Um, I do want you all to know that there really is help available. And one of the best things the feds have done with the uniform guidance is they've empowered this group COFAR, the Council on Financial Assistance Reform, to essentially interpret the uniform guidance. And they really have fabulous frequently asked questions up on their website. They are very, very helpful and they're in very much common speech. Another really good resource is from CAPLAW, which is a national technical assistance uh, organization that provides legal help to community action agencies, but everybody can use their resources and they have done a lot of work um, interpreting the uniform guidance, especially around indirect costs. So they have some good FAQs. Another resource is the California Association of Nonprofits. Now, you're in Washington, but it doesn't matter. This is, these are federal rules, and Cal Nonprofits is really working hard on getting resources up on this website. I should also mention that the Washington Association of Nonprofits is working on this issue, too. So watch their information because they're going to be putting up some new resources very, very soon. Um, and, I, you know, this Cal nonprofit, nonprofit Overhead Project really has some incredible resources if you want to understand more about the context for all of this. Well, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, timing is everything, and uh, it really is in this case because I think our starting point is to talk to each of your funding sources to be very clear, first of all, is there federal money in this agreement? Does the uniform guidance apply? Are there any administrative cost limitations? Are you going to negotiate indirect costs? So you've got some questions to ask them. Once you know the answers from all of your different funding sources, then you can use some of the spreadsheet examples that we've had in this webinar to um, really test out what might work best for you. And 
I hope that you, you won't suffer in silence and that you will let WICSAP know if you're having problems, let your state association know if you're having problems. I'm happy to try to help if you want to email me and talk to me about some of the challenges you're having. Because it, it, this is not an easy area, but it is a huge opportunity. Um, so what do I hope you're going to do as a result of being in on this webinar? Well, I hope you'll get really clear on what you're doing now to recover indirect costs. I hope you'll test out the 10% rate because it could work well for your organization. If you have a federal award, I hope you'll think about applying for a negotiated indirect cost rate. I hope you'll find a way to talk about these choices with your independent auditor uh, that doesn't get them all worried that you're trying to get them to make management decisions, but just uses them as a tremendous resource that they are. And uh, with that, I am really ready for questions. So, um, Sandy, have you been spotting questions all along? I haven't been looking as, as we go. So. Yes, I've been um, taking the questions, responding to the ones that I can. Um, and from what I can tell, you have answered all the questions that have come up um, so far. So what we can do now is just leave the chat open for a little bit and see if anybody um, has any other specific questions related to the information that you shared with us today. Okay, well, I, I just saw Christine's question about would the rate disappear when the award ends? And I actually do have an answer to that question. Um, and when the, when the award ends, if you don't have another federal award, you're going to be kind of stuck because you won't have anyone to negotiate your next provisional rate with. You, with the one that gave it to you, you'll finish up, you'll get the final rate from them. But then there, if you don't have any more funds, you can't negotiate again. And that would kind of leave you in a bad way because having had a federal indirect cost rate, you can't use the de minimis 10%. So if I knew that I only had one federal award and it was ending and I was never going to get another one, I probably would not negotiate a rate. So with that, I, I think that's it. Uh, and I and just I review them again, and that is the only question that was left out there. Oh, one just came up. Are you able to um, see that? Okay, that's uh, Jorge. Uh, if you currently have federal funding using the direct charge method for indirect expenses, but you want to negotiate a rate, what would happen to the existing grant? Really good question. Okay, um, you're probably not going to be able to amend the budget in your existing grant for this year. If what you have is a multi-year award, some of those multi-year federal awards actually are structured in a way that it is considered to be something of a renegotiation each year. That is, if your award allows you to resubmit and readjust the budget component as you begin the next year of the award, in that situation, if you had gone in and gotten a negotiated indirect cost rate, you could use it going forward. It would be totally at your funder's discretion whether they would be willing to amend the budget of your open grant in, in the year that you were already in to allow you to use it. Some of them might because this is simpler for them, too, but they would certainly be within their rights to say, no, uh, we don't make those changes during the grant year. Those have to be made at the time when we sign off on the next year's budget. Okay, did that, did we get it? Looks like it. So I can, um, how about if we leave the chat open for about another three minutes and see if any further questions come in? Um, if not, then we'll go ahead and end it at 2.20. Um, again, if you have more than one participant sitting at the computer taking this today and you need um, your, C, your uh, continuing sexual assault hours, please email me at Sandy at wixapp.org, or if you have any questions, um, you can also reach me through my email. And this will be up uh, within a week on uh, our website. So again, thank you all for joining us, and we will leave the chat open for just a few more minutes.